Hello, gang. Professor McElroy here. Uh, welcome to week two, learning module two for graphic design one. Uh, really good job uh, last week on Photoshop. Uh, our exploration of raster-based design, right? Pixels and picture-based design. I hope everyone's been peeking at the announcement section a little bit during the week. I don't know if you noticed that I post Pepsi came out with a limited edition flavor called Pixels. So I haven't found that yet in the store yet, but I'm pretty interested in seeing what that tastes like because I've been designing with Pixels for 25 years and never really thought of it as a flavor. So uh, I thought you maybe got a kick out of that. I saw that on the news the other day and I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, they're getting kind of desperate here when they're naming sodas after design elements, but okay, whatever. Uh, this week is all about Adobe Illustrator, which is vector-based drawing, scalable graphics. Uh, so if you can think of anything out in the world that's branding-wise that looks like an illustration, logos, text, uh, gr graphics that are full of fills and strokes, look like something someone has drawn with their hand. Think about like a coloring book that has those outline strokes, and then you fill in the colors on the inside, that's what Illustrator is. It is by far my favorite program. I can use every single program in Adobe CC and I'm pretty fluently functional in all of them, uh, but I like Adobe Illustrator. I like to draw, I like to trace things. I like to create a graphic that could work the size of a stamp and also could be put on the side of a skyscraper at 80 feet by 80 feet. You can literally create something in Illustrator and it will be crystal clear the size of a stamp and also as big as a building graphic or what we call an environmental graphic. It's crazy. I love Illustrator by far my favorite program. So I'm gonna to try to keep the lecture tonight because it is a simpler program, uh, a little bit closer to the eight o'clock range, eight, 8.30 so I can give you some time to play around in the, uh, in the book. Uh, creating some illustrations. Uh, just about everyone completed all of the Photoshop projects. Very good job. Basic cutting out objects, uh, bringing elements from different images into one image, understanding layers, understanding pixels and selecting pixels and how you can copy and paste and manipulate pixels. Really good job with the first four projects inside your Photoshop uh, classroom in a book textbook. This week, it's all about Adobe Illustrator. So we're dealing with illustrations, hence the name Illustrator. Uh, you can use it on your computer. Now there's an app for your Samsung Galaxy or your iPad or whatever you wanna create with. Some students that feel more comfortable drawing, they use a pencil on a tablet and you can literally draw scalable graphics right on the screen, right in the program. You could take a photograph, trace over the top of it, make an illustration out of it. I mean, there's really a million ways to skin a cat in Illustrator. The end product is a scalable graphic, something you can make the size of a stamp or as big as the side of a building graphic or a bus graphic or a billboard, anything you can think of that's massive in size and as graphic design has touched Illustrator. Because remember Photoshop, you can't scale up, right? If you make it bigger than its original quality, it becomes blurry. You can't duplicate pixels and make them bigger. It is what it is. Why do you think there's a race in smartphones that make the most high resolution, greatest quality camera they can possibly make on a phone, right? Samsung's trying to get the 64 megabytes and, and then racing to make it even higher resolution. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? The pixel ratios, they're all racing to get to the highest number. Why are they racing to get to the highest number? Because output for photographs is 100% final output. So if you want to make something really big, the picture has to be really big. I mean, that's kind of the trick of it. Not in Illustrator. If you create it in Illustrator, you can scale that thing up as big as you want to make it or shrink it as small as you want to make it. And it will still produce itself perfectly crystal clear. That's the reason why logos are created in Illustrator. That's why the illustrations you see on packaging design, whether it's drink illustration or cereal boxes or anything you see that's a product out in the food store that has an illustration, that's Illustrator. Why do they do that? Because the illustration has to be on packaging, on labels, on advertising, on billboards. It needs to be itty bitty and huge. 
even a soft drink has a small can and a big two liter, right? Small can, big two liter. They both have to have the same graphic. So that's why Illustrator is so critical in the branding design world of graphic design. So that's kind of the difference between Photoshop and Illustrator. Think photographs, Photoshop, think illustrations, Illustrator. Anything you see in the world that's branding related, a way that a product or service is selling itself, if it looks like an illustration, more than likely it was created in Illustrator. If it looks like a photograph, more than likely it was created in Photoshop. But illustrators have gotten really good and things that look like were created in Photoshop, they look like pictures, are actually illustrations. So we've really started to blend and cross the line between what is real photographs and what is digital illustrations. And you see that a lot with 3D cans, 3D bottles, 3D products that illustrators have created in a 3D world in Illustrator, so they're scalable. They can control uh, uh, any perspiration on the bottles. They can control moisture and water and lighting. They can do all that virtually that they can't do taking a photograph of a product that they're sitting on a table that they're photographing. That's why product photographers like food photographers, they airbrush like clear chemicals on the food so that you don't get all the weird lighting and the weird details and the highlights. They make it artificial as they can, even though it's a Big Mac from McDonald's. They just spray it with a clear coating so that they don't get artificial things happening from the world on the cheeseburger that they're photographing that they want to put on packaging or on a bag or something like that. So just kind of keep that in mind. The programs are starting to cross over a little bit. And there's many programs out there that have raster-based elements and vector-based elements, meaning you can do photo manipulation and you can draw vector graphics. And Affinity Designer is a really popular one that you can download to your desktop. You can put on your iPad if you have an iPad or another tablet. Uh, I think it's like $20 and you can use it for life. I mean, it's really ridiculous. So there's lots of apps out there that are starting to evolve that realized Photoshop and Illustrator were really cool, but we might be able to do it for less or better or different. And so I always teach the process and teach you the differences of all the different things we're doing, but there are lots of tools out there to do the exact same thing. The final product is you need a scalable vector graphic for Illustrator to use for branding, and you need some high quality, high resolution output image from Photoshop, whether it be a, a TIFF or a JPEG or a PDF or the PSD file, you need those things to do your professional advertisements and the things that are photo based. So just know the difference. Don't be giving me image overlays for the chapters in Illustrator because it's not photographs, it's illustrations. They're scalable graphics. Your booklet chapters have you like, it used to be build a snowman from all the parts, the carrot nose, the eyes, the buttons and everything. Now it's a, like a, a little dog or bear or something that you put the head and you put the nose and mouth and everything on to collage it together. It's the same process. You're just taking vector elements and putting them all together. So we'll draw a nice cream cone and a couple of things tonight so we can see how the tools work. But the program's relatively simple in nature. It just has a lot of ways you can do things. So Okay, so without any more chatter, let's get into Adobe Illustrator. So before we actually open Adobe Illustrator, make sure you go into the announcement section and download a couple of files that I put into the week two lecture files, download for Thursday announcement in your announcement section. I downloaded a couple of EPS files, which is a file type that Illustrator takes. Uh, that we can play around with a little bit later after we look at the general kind of basic dashboard of Illustrator. So I'm gonna go ahead and download this and dump it on my desktop and I'm gonna unzip it. And we don't have to worry about this files, these files just yet. Uh, we're gonna create those a little bit later and play around with them, but just make sure that you download them and put them somewhere that you have access to them. We're gonna go into Illustrator first and talk about artboards and shape tools and line segment tools and the pen tool and all that stuff that's in uh, Illustrator, but just make sure you have those files downloaded because we're gonna play around with those a little bit later after we do some free drawing and some basic drawing stuff in Illustrator from scratch. And then we'll take a look at some detailed, little more detailed graphics. 
And these graphics I downloaded from Vectezy.com. Vectezy.com is kind of like Pexels.com for photos and video. Vectezy.com is vector graphics. They're free to download, play around with, chop apart, combine. You can download multiple files and combine multiple files all into one. So if you're a little bit intimidated in the Illustrator environment, Vectezy.com is awesome. And you can see right here, if I typed in something like a bird into Vectezy, you're gonna see all of these illustrated vector graphics. All the ones that say free, you can actually download for free. And we'll take a look at that in a few minutes. So you don't have to be able to draw. You just have to be creative and know where to find things. Look at this hummingbird, it's beautiful. It's completely vector and you can download it for free and play around with it. Of course, they're trying to sell you ones that are not free, but when educational purposes, we're just learning how to create things and combine things and build things. Free is really good. We don't need anything more than that. So, all right, so let's get in to Illustrator. So little AI is the little icon there in Adobe Illustrator. Remember Photoshop is PS. Uh, PSD is the file extension, but it's PS in the icon. Illustrator is AI or .ai for the file extension. Photoshop is picture-based, pixels, right? Resolution, DPI, this number of pixels wide by this number of pixels tall. Remember that Illustrator is a vector program where everything is scalable. It is not tied to pixels. So if you're creating something in Photoshop and you wanna bring something in like text or a logo or an illustration to use in a design in Photoshop, you actually wanna create it in Illustrator and copy and paste it into Photoshop. And then you have the pixels of the photographs and the scalable vector object of the Illustrator file. When you see ads and you see designs that have both illustrations and photographs in them, they were collaged in a number of programs. They could have been collaged in Illustrator where you import photographs into Illustrator. They could have been collaged in Photoshop where you build your pictures in Photoshop and you copy and paste logos into Photoshop to make your final output. The beauty about Adobe is you can bring things from different programs into one program. So if you take nothing out of graphic design one, Photoshop is photos, pixels, resolution, really high quality images. Illustrator is scalable vector graphics, logos, text, illustrations, icons, graphics that look like they have fills, colors inside, and strokes, lines around the edge. Think coloring book, strokes around the edge of the outline of the coloring book, color inside of the shapes with the pencil or the crayon. In essence, that is Illustrator. We're creating two-dimensional fills and stroked shapes that are completely scalable. Size of a stamp, as big as an environmental graphic that goes on the side of a train or a bus or a building graphic or a billboard, right? That's the difference between the two programs. So if your brain immediately switches to one or the other based on the project you're trying to create, Photoshop, photos, Illustrator, scalable graphics, logos, text, illustrations, icons, symbols, all those things on your phone when you download apps, all those little logos, the F for Facebook, the IN for LinkedIn, the little camera icon for Instagram, all Illustrator, icons, text, colorful shapes, illustrations, all Illustrator. When you look at any of the touchscreen stuff that's happening now in a car, on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, all of those buttons, those apps, those icons, everything that's illustration based, Illustrator. If you're making your phone own app, all the buttons you touch in your app that open up the features of the program, Illustrator, 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 Illustrator. Why is that important? Because when you create an app, it needs to be something you can use on an itty bitty phone, a big phone, a tablet, potentially a desktop. So think scalability. If it has to work in multiple sizes, it's Illustrator. Logos, Illustrator. Can you create a logo in Photoshop? Absolutely. Is it the best idea? Absolutely not. Even if you're creating a logo for a company that only exists on the web, eventually they're going to want a t-shirt or they're going to want a bag giveaway or they're going to want something where their logo needs to be bigger. 
I can't tell you the number of companies that reach out to me and are like, we had somebody create this logo for us and they made it in Photoshop. And now we want to embroider the logo on shirts to give to our employees. And it's a photograph. It's not scalable. They can't use it to screen print. They can't use it for the stitching machine to embroider something. If you own an embroidery machine or a screen printing machine or any of those, a cry cut, they're all using vector graphics, fills and strokes that are scalable. Cry cuts like the new machine or Cricut or however you pronounce it, right? You make, I see people making graphics for their cars and sticking them on the windows and the whole nine yards. All of that clip art is vector graphics. It's illustrator, it's scalable. You can shrink it down, you can blow it up, you cut it out of a machine. If it can be cut out of that machine, it's illustrator, fills and strokes. That's how the machine works. So I'm just trying to give a lot of different ways to connect the dots with Illustrator. Okay, so we have the basic program open. We're just gonna go into a letter piece of paper because we're gonna talk about all the same things we talked about with Photoshop. We're just now gonna talk about it with Illustrator. We talked about the pasteboard, the artboard, the page, the canvas, whatever you wanna call it in Photoshop when we opened the original document last week in Photoshop, we had this white document with the gray pasteboard over here. We talked about the fact that the pasteboard was invisible, right? We called it bleeding to the edge. So if you brought a picture and put it in the middle of the artboard and you moved it over the edge, it disappeared when it went off the page. Well, guess what? Illustrator, that's not how it works. Illustrator has a pasteboard where you can see the object off of the artboard, right? I can move this left to right and I can still see it. I can move it all the way off to the edge, all the way up to this edge. I can move it to the top, I can move it to the bottom. Is there still a full bleed? Yeah, it goes to the edge of the document, but you can actually see beyond the document. So that's the difference. But one thing that is not different is the fact that anything that exists on the pasteboard in Illustrator does not exist for the final output. Just like if you moved it off the page in Photoshop and you couldn't see it anymore, the stuff that was off the page really didn't exist in your document. It was there, it was just off the page because it doesn't show you the pasteboard in Photoshop. Illustrator is no different. Students will sometimes give me a PDF and I'll be like, I can't see the whole design. They'll be like, you could see it, it's right here in Illustrator. I'm like, just because it's on your pasteboard, that's fine, but once you save it as a PDF, the PDF only shows what's in the artboard. It doesn't show what's in the pasteboard, which is over here. I use the pasteboard to put stuff that isn't part of my final design, but I might use it for elements at another time. So I actually use the pasteboard as a collection area for other elements I'm using to design that maybe I didn't use now on this artboard, but I might use it as a later date. I actually just use it as a resources area in my document in Illustrator. If it's off the page and you save it as a PDF or a JPEG out of Illustrator, it does not exist. Only thing that exists is the edge of this artboard, just like Photoshop. The difference is you can actually see it when you move it off the page, right? Even though my design only includes what's on the white, I actually can move the document so that it is off the edge a little bit. It exists, but it won't exist in my final output. My output is only the edge of the document. Many students are very much more comfortable in Illustrator because they don't have to worry about having something over here that they can't see. You can see everything you need to see in Illustrator, whether it's on the artboard or off the artboard, right? Only thing you have to worry about is this little page right here, which is called our artboard, our canvas, our page, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Illustrator calls it artboard. You can see it right over here, artboard number one. Remember, these are our palettes over here. We're gonna look at these palettes as we navigate a little bit. Also remember that Essentials is the default workspace, the same as it was for Photoshop. There are other setups 
of all of these palettes, right? These are the same list of palettes for the most part that we had under the window drop down in Photoshop. The only difference is we're in Illustrator and there are a few different ones because we're in a vector program and not a raster based program, but we're working in the same ballpark. You should understand that the toolbar is over here and the palettes are over here. The exact same thing as Photoshop. Toolbar over here, palettes over here. Palettes are a grouping of information where like things are stored. Same as in Photoshop. Layers, just like Photoshop. Properties, just like Photoshop. Text tool, just like Photoshop, right? Character palette. Lots of these color palette swatches, just like Photoshop, lots of the same things. And you may even notice a few of the same things over here. The selection area, the pen tool, the shape tool, the paintbrush, the text tool, the eyedropper, all the same as Photoshop, the magnifying glass or zoom. Yes, there are some different tools over here. The reason there are some different tools is because we're in a raster environment or a vector environment, not raster, right? You saw things like the lasso tool, right? The selection tool in Photoshop. You saw magic wand tools, you know, different things because we were dealing with pixels, not vector shapes. Vector shapes are made up of fills and strokes. And remember in the toolbar in Photoshop, these two little squares down here in the bottom of the toolbar. The top left square was called the foreground in Photoshop and the bottom right square was the background. Well, you may notice in Illustrator, the top left is fill and the bottom right is stroke. So instead of the bottom right being white, because remember the artboard or the background was white in Photoshop. That bottom right isn't background. The background's white on this canvas. It's just white. It's the stroke. The fill is the color inside of the shape and the stroke is the color on the edge. The fill is the color you add to a coloring book page by coloring in the shapes. The stroke is the outline of the illustration that you're filling in in a coloring book. Fill and stroke. Same kind of concept, just a little bit different because we're in a vector environment. We're not in a raster environment. All right. Now, you'll notice over in the toolbar, there aren't many tools I really need to explain for us to get started here. It's a very basic drawing program. Much of your chapter work is actually just changing colors, changing scale, copying and pasting, and combining elements that they already have on the page for you. And I have to say, your chapter assignments have some beautiful professional illustration elements. I mean, the poster you manipulate, the illustration you direct select and move parts around with is really beautifully done. And when you see the files I have for the lecture tonight, you're going to be like, wow, these are really beautiful illustration elements. You don't have to draw them. You just have to know how to use them, manipulate them, modify them, change them, copy and paste them, combine them in a new and unique way. Why do you think there are so many photo libraries where you can go get really nice pictures to use? Because there's some people that take really good pictures and some people that don't. Why do you think there are scalable graphics out there that you can go, your Cricut machine has all kinds of beautiful illustrations you just download on your computer and you cut them out on these little stickers or pieces of paper, right? Everybody, everybody designs their own Disney t-shirts because they download Mickey from the Cricut machine and put it on a t-shirt. I mean, it's really crazy what you can do, um, right? That's all free graphics, free vector stuff. Your job is to combine them in a new and unique way, right? So Vectezi is a really great educational tool to download really beautiful scalable vector graphics and EPS files that you don't need to know how to draw one iota. You just need to know how to copy the pieces, paste them in, make new pieces, change the color of the pieces, change the scale of the pieces, manipulate the pieces and make your own unique thing. I want a bird landing on a flower with a butterfly on the pellet in a grass field with a blue sky and a sunshine. 
You don't need to know how to create any of those things. You find a beautiful grass field. You find a really nice sunshine. You find some blue skies. You find a flower. You find a bird. You find a butterfly. You copy all of those graphics into one artboard from multiple artboards and you make your own story. That's how illustration works. If you like to draw, awesome. If you're good at drawing, awesome. If you wanna practice and try to draw, awesome. All of those things are awesome. I like to draw, I create my own illustrations. A lot of my logo work is done in what we call a combination mark, which means there's a graphic and text. All the graphics are created by me. If I'm drawing birds or, or, or bears or butterflies or, wow, a lot of bees, any bee things, right? I draw them myself. I may even get a photograph of a bumblebee and then put it in Illustrator and using the pen tool, draw over top of the photograph and make my own illustration of the bee based on the photograph of a bee, which a lot of students feel really comfortable doing because they don't know scale. They don't really know hierarchy as far as what should be big and what should be small. They're not really great with perspective. I don't really like to draw in a sketchbook. I wouldn't really consider myself a draw person but they can trace a photograph of a bird and make shapes using a pen tool and a paintbrush. They don't have to know perspective or scale or proportion per se. It's gonna come out really great because you're using the photo of something. Do you know figure drawings people, even the masters used wooden models where they were skeleton wooden figures that they bent around their arms and legs and their head and their torso. And they drew the characters based on the little wooden figure they had sitting on their artboard or their desk. They didn't necessarily know perspective all that well either. The head was eight, eight heads make up the body, right? You learn all those things when you learn to draw figures, but they used a little wooden figurine too and bent it around and stretched it. You ever notice the Disney? when they do animations, they make models of the characters and the animators look at the model, bend the legs, then arms and head, rotate the model, and then they draw what they see. So photographs are a really great way to learn perspective and scale and hierarchy and kind of how things look and shape. And you don't have to be someone who draws. So don't be intimidated by Illustrator. You can trace over the top of something just like anyone can. And at the very end of this lecture, we're going to trace over the photo of a bird just to show you that you don't be intimidated by the process. Let's see what you can do. Your book gives you all the graphics anyway, but I hope maybe a little fire in you is like, I'm going to go get a picture of Mickey Mouse. I'm going to try to draw his ears with the circle tool, right? Maybe you'll get a little inspired by seeing how things work in this little hour and 45 minute lecture or so and it'll inspire you to do it. If you practice a little bit, you get a lot better at it. I've had students who don't like to draw, never touched a paper and pencil before, and they ended up drawing murals for some of the local businesses that I gave them as a project, and they did awesome. And they didn't know how to draw at all. They never took our class. They were intimidated by a pencil, and they were able to make digital art really well. So just keep an open mind, a little bit of practice and process, and you could really like it and be good at it too. And maybe if you have a cry cut machine, maybe you'll start making your own graphics and putting those on t-shirts and car graphics. And you know, you can go to etsy.com and you can sell all those graphics to other people and you just cut them out of your cr cricket machine and then you can sell them. People make a huge business out of it. $25 a graphic, they make a little horse, they cut it out in their uh, cricket machine and they put it on their cars because they are equestrian lovers and they just create original horse illustrations. People make businesses out of that, legitimate businesses, five-figure businesses out of simple illustrations that they make at their homes, they create them in machines, they sell them for 25 bucks a piece, they charge you $5 to ship, even though it only costs you a dollar to ship it. And you're like, you're charging me $5 to ship a sticker that's four inches by four inches, knowing they paid 39 cents to ship it. But that's part of making money, right? That's part of being a small business. So let's see if we can't create a little bit of scalable graphics here tonight in Illustrator. Don't be intimidated. I'm left-handed and I learned to draw with the mouse with my right hand. You know why I did? Because the wire to the mouse didn't reach the left side when I was in school. So I had to use my right hand. It was like someone slapping my left hand every time I went to the computer. So I am not ambidextrous at all. I can't do a single thing with my right hand except draw with the mouse. So if I can draw with the mouse on my right hand, 
I think you should be able to draw with the mouse with your dominant hand. So don't be intimidated. So let's see what we can create here tonight. Okay. That's my little rant as it relates to Illustrator. Uh, open mind, let's give it a try. Let's play around a little bit and let's see what happens. Well, let's look at the toolbar first. The very first thing that you should notice is the same arrow that's in Photoshop, right? A selection tool. I call it the global selection arrow. The reason I call it the global selection arrow is because the little white arrow below it is called the direct select arrow. So think of it this way. The global selection arrow or the one on the top is the one you use to select the entire object as a whole. The arrow underneath of it called the direct select tool is where you can select little parts of an object that's created in Illustrator. So we need an object in Illustrator in order to see how these two selection arrows work. So I'm gonna delete the one I drew. Let's go right down here to the one, two, three, four, fifth tool in the toolbar, which is the shape tool. And if I actually click on this and hold it down, it will expand and it will show you the basic shapes you can draw in Illustrator. And I've seen people do some ridiculously amazing things with just the circle tool or the ellipse tool because they have warps and arches and all kinds of things you can do in Illustrator. So you can draw a bunch of circles, select them all together and put a weird uh, effect on it. And you'll turn all those circles into like a butterfly flying in the air that's semi blurred. I mean, you can use these basic shape tools and create some really amazing things. So let's select the ellipse tool. So we're just gonna click on the shapes tools, hold the shapes tool down so it expands and you'll see the ellipse or the circle tool. Now, here it is. And it has these crosshairs, right? Has these little four lines with a little dot in the middle. And all that is is saying, we're gonna create a shape here inside the artboard. Now, let's just click and hold our mouse down and drag. And you keep the mouse held down as you're dragging because you'll notice this little blue shape is starting to be drawn and you're gonna see that the circle just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? But you'll also notice that it isn't a circle, perfect circle, because as I'm clicking and dragging it, it's not scaling, what we call scaling proportionately. If I hold the shift key down and I click and drag all while I have my mouse held, so I haven't let my mouse go. You're gonna notice we're create, I know it's cold in here. Uh, we're gonna create an actual perfect circle, right? So if we don't let, hold down the shift key and I, I haven't released my mouse yet. So I'm just drawing kind of the shape that I'm showing you. That is not a perfect circle. If you hold down shift and draw, you get a perfect circle. So we're gonna draw a perfect circle for the most part. And we're gonna let the mouse go. And you're gonna notice that we create this little shape. Now, just like Photoshop when I was lecturing and I said, once you draw something, go back to the regular selection arrow so you don't do something you don't want to do, like paint over the top of a picture or something like that. I say the same thing about Illustrator. So once I draw a circle in Illustrator, I go back to the global selection arrow. That way I don't click and draw another circle and another circle and another circle and another circle when maybe I just wanted to draw one circle. So I draw my circle and I go back to what I call my global selection arrow, which they call the selection tool in Illustrator. But over the many, many years, I've just started calling it global because it was the easiest way for me to explain to students that if you have the top arrow selected and you click and hold your mouse down, you move the whole shape. Now, when you create an object in Illustrator, the object has what's called a bounding box, which is this little blue box around the entire shape. I called it a bounding box in Photoshop when we checked the show transform tool in Photoshop. And I told you, I showed you how you could scale or rotate a graphic in Photoshop. And I said, this is called a bounding box. It's the same bounding box. This bounding box is the same as Photoshop because it also has handles, which are these little white squares on the edge of the bounding box. And remember from Photoshop that you can do two things with the bounding box. One is you can scale this thing up and down by grabbing the corner and holding down the mouse. And if you hold down shift, you'll scale it up and down proportionately. Now, well, watch when I make it a little bit bigger. 
it's still perfect. Unlike Photoshop, if I made that a little bit bigger, it would start getting blurry. These are scalable graphics, graphics that have fills and graphics that have strokes, which is that little line on the outside of the shape. So the global selection arrow lets us select a whole object to scale it up and down and also to rotate it. Those are the two transform controls inside of the bounding box. But this thing is a circle, so it doesn't matter how I spin this thing around, it doesn't look any different, right? It's a circle. The only difference is when I select it, I can see the bounding box again. So let me rotate it back so that it's semi close to being straight, the bounding box. Okay. So with the selection arrow, you select entire shapes of fills and strokes, grouped or ungrouped, depending on if they're grouped or not. And we're going to see that in the files that I have for lecture two that we downloaded to our desktop or EPS files. We're going to see what group and ungroup looks like in objects that are created more complex in Illustrator. Now, before I go to the direct select arrow, I just want you to recognize that this shape has a fill and a stroke, right? So whatever your fill color was, and I just double clicked on the fill to get my little picker for colors, whatever your fill color is, is the top left swatch, and whatever your stroke color is, the line on the edge is the bottom right. So I'm actually going to switch that color just so that you can see that this has a fill of purple and a stroke now of this shade of blue. Now, fill and stroke. Those are the properties of all shapes in Illustrator. They either have a fill and a stroke or a fill and no stroke or a no fill and stroke right? They're empty on the inside, but they have a stroke on the outside. Every shape in Illustrator has a fill and a stroke. You may say no or no stroke, which is what this little slash is down here on the swatch. If I click on that, you're going to notice my shape has no stroke on the edge of it. If I click it and add the stroke back, there is my stroke. If I go to fill, I can make no fill. No fill, which means it's transparent in the inside, just like the checkerboard from lecture one in Photoshop. There's no color inside this shape. And I'll prove it because I'm going to draw a rectangle. I'm going to fill it with purple. I'm going to send it to back. And now you see that line going over my rectangle, that means this thing's in the front and it has a stroke, but I can see the rectangle behind it. So there's no fill, but look what happens if I add the fill back and I make this a different color. This object has a fill and a stroke now, but look. Fill and stroke on this object, fill and stroke on this object. And remember from Photoshop, I was like, if you right click on anything, you're gonna get the basic commands that you wanna do in any program, right? So we right clicked on it and we saw like release layer from background or layer zero from background, or we right clicked on it and it was like, do you wanna duplicate the layer or copy the layer? All of the basic features when you right click on something, Illustrator is no different. If you get in a pinch and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this object right click on it. More than not, it's going to give you options. And all I did was right click on it and say move to front or right click on it and send to back. So just so that you can see that this environment also exists like pieces of paper, something on top, something in the middle, something in the background. So as you stack objects on top of each other, which you can see them right there, they move to front and back. And just like Photoshop, if there is a fill or there's pixels on the inside of an image, if you have something behind it, you're not going to see it. If there's a fill on an object and it sits on top of another object, you're not going to see the object behind it. The beauty about Illustrator is you can just click and drag stuff around and it, oh my gosh, I don't know where that is. Oh, there it is right there. Let me just stretch this out and move. It's much easier 
to function in Illustrator because you can move things all over the place. And even if you move it off the artboard, it doesn't disappear. It's still there, right? It's still there. We can see it. You just don't see it in your finished design. So for me, I use the pasteboard to put samples of illustrations. I put little color swatches sometimes. I text words like directions to myself. Make sure that you export this thing in a high quality PDF so that the client can use it, right? I actually use the text tool and put little notes out here sometimes. So I use the pasteboard as just a place to gather things that I'm not actually using in my finished design. Okay. Global selection arrow selects the object as a whole. We talked about the fill and the stroke. The fill is the top left little square on the toolbar and the stroke is the bottom right square on the toolbar. So we got all that stuff covered. Now, I wanna show you that the fill color, if you double click on any object you create in Illustrator, you can actually change that fill to any color you want, right? You can change it to any color you want. There's also what's called a swatches palette over here, which gives you the basic color swatches that Illustrator thinks most people will use. So you can see that they got shades of green, shades of blue, shades of brown, shades of red, orange, and yellow, some purples over there, right? It has some basic colors over there. When in doubt and you're just looking for a blue, you can always use the swatches palette over here. You'll also notice that there is the color palette, which is the same spectrum you get from double clicking over here on the fill square. It's just here as a color palette. If you don't have it as a default palette, when you open your program, remember all palettes are under the window dropdown. So if you go to the window dropdown and you scroll down to color, it's the same palette that's over here. If you click on the window dropdown and go to swatches, it's the same palette that's over here. So if you ever see anything in your book that says, open up the gradient palette, open up the color palette, open up the swatches palette, open up the properties palette. If it asks you for anything that exists in the photo over on this right-hand side, just like Photoshop, it's under the windows dropdown. The windows dropdown is where all the palettes are. Now. The reason I wanted to show you that is because by default, a shape has a one point stroke on it, which is what you see right here. It has a fill and a stroke. So if you add color to the stroke of an object, you create an illustrator, you're gonna get this little solid line around the edge of it. You can actually change the thickness and the location of that stroke by using the stroke palette. Hmm, where's the stroke palette? Well, let's check out the window dropdown. If we go to the window drop down and we scroll all the way down, you're gonna notice that stroke palette is one of the options. So let's pick on the stroke palette. So here's my little stroke palette right here. Now, the stroke palette has things that you might recognize as I have the object selected and I click the up arrow. Look how thick the stroke is getting on the shape I drew. Remember, you have to have the shape selected in order to make any modifications to the object. It's kind of like having to have the layer selected that you're working on in Photoshop to make sure that whatever you want to do to the layer, you're doing to the actual layer you have selected, right? Nothing different, only in Illustrator you use in the global selection arrow and you're selecting your shape. So you can make the line really thick. You can make the line really thin. One thing I really like about the stroke palette is you can change where the stroke is located on the shape. So you'll notice that the stroke is actually centered right on the actual edge of the shape. Well, let's look at what this one is. Stroke on the inside. So watch when I click. It goes to the inside of the shape. Well, look at the last one, outside. If I click on the outside, it goes to the outside of the shape. The default is middle, then there's inside, and there's outside. Well, outside becomes really important when you have small shapes that you've drawn in Illustrator. Because if you make it the inside, look how much of the shape is filled in by the stroke. It's the nature of the beast. If it's the middle, only half of that is filled in with the stroke. By default, when I'm drawing things in Illustrator for clients, logos or digital illustrations or whatever, I make sure the stroke is on the outside of the shape so that the fill 
is the full shape and the stroke is on the outside. It's really important because if I was to make this shape really small, so I'm gonna shrink this baby down really small, right? When I make it the inside, look how much of that shape. So watch if I make it bigger. It's eating the entire inside of the shape up with the stroke. But if I switch it to the outside, it doesn't matter how big I make the stroke, the inside is still the same size. Now the stroke is getting bigger than the inside almost now because I'm cranking up the strokes. But isn't that interesting? Now it looks like a record, if anyone knows what a record is, right? It's the outside with the label on the inside, right? So I like to have the strokes made on the outside of the shape. So even if I grab clip art and I'm using it to create an illustration for something, I need a flower real quick and there's a beautiful daisy out there and I grab it. I'm going to put the stroke on the outside so you get the full fill of the inside of the shape, just so you know. So the stroke palette for me is a default palette. So if I don't have it, I click on it and I drag it until it turns blue over here in the little stripe of palettes and I can drop it right into the little stripe of palettes. So I take my palettes and I stack them all up, the ones that I use a lot. So if I do strokes a lot, I, I put a palette over there. If I use the Pathfinder tool, which is one we're gonna use tonight, I put it over there. The Pathfinder tool actually isn't a default palette under the essential setting, but I use the Pathfinder tool a lot. So I'm gonna show you guys that as we create some basic illustrations tonight. So, okay, so we created a basic shape. We used a global selection. So I could show you that there's a fill and a stroke and that the stroke palette, one of the palettes on the right-hand side, can adjust how thick the line is on the outside shape of it. So you can really quickly now see the difference between a fill object that has no stroke and a fill object that has a really big stroke. I mean, look at the difference between those two objects, one without a stroke and one with a stroke, right? So if I copy and paste, edit, copy, edit, paste, or command, copy, command C, command V, right? And I just take the stroke off the second shape. Look at this thing. It looks totally different than the one with the stroke. Sometimes it's better not to have a stroke. If your object is something people can recognize, like the silhouette of a shape, like let's say a bird or a hummingbird that you're using for a logo and you're putting a little bird next to text, it might be better without a stroke. Because remember, if the illustration or the digital drawing is used to be embroidered on a t-shirt, strokes are really hard to do. Normally you see logos that are embroidered on shirts, they're silhouettes. They're just a shape with color inside of it. I love that they invented that cricket machine because it's an easy way to explain a lot of things now as it relates to Illustrator because most people have at least seen what the thing can do by seeing things that are for sale out there in the world that someone used that machine for. Uh, my wife was a teacher and now she's in administration for public schools and one of her friends is still a teacher and she makes a different shirt for like every day of the week practically for her class because she teaches in elementary school and she makes them all on her cricket machine. So it doesn't matter what the day is. It could be National Hot, hot Dog Day and she would make a hot dog and print it and put it on her shirt and wear it to her job the next day. She must have a closet full of hundreds of shirts of all the different days of the year, but I'm not that into it. But at least you can see now by description, illustrator, fills and strokes and global selection arrow. Now, the reason I spent so much time with the regular selection arrow, the global selection arrow, and what an object looks like with fills and strokes in there and the properties of the bounding box when you select it, because we got this little arrow called the direct select arrow. Now, the difference between the global selection arrow and the direct select arrow is the direct select arrow lets me select just one point in the shape. Well, this is beautiful, right? So these little squares are called nodes and nodes are where a 
a line in a shape changes a direction. So when you have a line that's got a lot of squiggly lines in it, you have a node everywhere that the line wiggles in a vector drawing. So a circle has four nodes. And you can see them right here, one top, bottom, left and right, because there's four spots in a circle where the object starts to change direction. It starts to arc the other direction. So it doesn't matter how close you zoom in, that point right there is when it starts going south. It starts curving the other direction, right? Now, the direct select is good and bad. The direct select is good because I can pick a particular spot and I can actually modify the shape by clicking and dragging any given spot or node in an illustration. Nodes have what are called anchors. These are called directional anchors. And you'll notice that each node in a circle has what's called the forward directional anchor, the one to the right, and the backwards directional anchor, which is the one to the left. The forward one is the one that controls the curve of the line going forward in the node. The anchor going back or backwards controls where the line came from, from the node. So watch if I grab the handle of the backward node. I can change the curve of the line that was going to that node. If I click the forward directional anchor, I can change the curve of the line in front of the node. But you will notice that the anchors are connected. So as I wiggle the forward directional anchor, the backwards directional anchor rotates. This is the hardest concept of Illustrator. Just like painting over pixels or manipulating pixels on the wrong layer in Photoshop because you don't know which layer you're on is the hardest thing. Manipulating pixels with anchors is the hardest skill in Illustrator by far. So if you can master the concept of layers in Photoshop and you can master the concept of selecting nodes in Illustrator, you have tackled the two toughest skills in the two programs that are primarily used in a lot of branding and visual communication. This tool is vital in selecting and manipulating illustrations. Yes, the global selection arrow is great for moving things around, copying and pasting things, right? But direct select is where you can really do some oddity things, right? Direct select is where you can manipulate. So think about all that clip art, all that free art, all of those vector graphics. If you wanna change the color of an eyeball in something that's already drawn, you direct select the eyeball and you change the fill color. And it's as easy as that. The trick is every node you select be very careful because if you squish it, pull it in, pull it out, change the directional anchor arc of a line, it's changing the shape, right? Just like if you select pixels in a photograph and fill in the selection, you've manipulated those pixels. No different in Illustrator. Okay. Global selection arrow selects the entire object. Direct selection arrow selects the nodes or particular points inside of any given shape, object, line, any fill, stroke, anything drawn inside Illustrator. So I'm going to use my global selection arrow and I'm going to click on each one of the shapes I've drawn and I'm going to hit delete. But watch if I use the direct select arrow and mistakenly pick just a point and hit delete. If I want to delete the whole shape, I need the regular global selection arrow. If I decide I really just want a half circle, well, it's a lot easier just to delete one node and I have a half circle, hence the little black pupil inside the eye of an illustration where the eyelid comes down and the 
it's not behind the eyelid. They just made a half a circle and filled it in black. Full circle, half circle. Watch what happens if I do a rectangle and I only delete one node of the rectangle. What if I move the fill or the stroke? Hmm, interesting. What if I only have a stroke, right? Fills and strokes. Global selection arrow selects the whole object. Direct select arrow selects a node in the object. It's really important to select a node in an object if you want to delete it, if you want to manipulate it, if you want to move the line, but only move a point on the line. That's how you modify illustrations and kind of make unique things. You can take an object that's been created and take a golden retriever and make it a hot dog dog real quick if you know the direct select arrow, because you can squish that dog and extend that dog. And all of a sudden you go from big 100 pound golden retriever down to a little chubby 20 pound hot dog dog or Dobson. So the direct select arrow is powerful, right? So look at this, this shape, which was a rectangle, I direct selected and got rid of one of the nodes and I removed the fill from it. And in essence, it's just a V now. And that started as a rectangle. So what if I was nervous and I couldn't use the pen tool, but I needed to make a right angle? Well, you could draw a rectangle, delete one of the nodes and remove the fill and you have a right angle. A rectangle, delete one node, you have a right angle. Well, I want a shorter right angle. Hold down shift. What if I global select that and I copy it over and over again? Remember, I can rotate them too. I'm using my arrow keys. Shapes are simple. How you delete nodes, you add nodes, you change fills, you change strokes. Your book spends a lot of time having you selecting shapes that are already drawn, change the fill color, direct a selected node, move that node around, take a star and make it a rectangle. It spends a lot of time using these two selection tools. You can do a lot with these two selection tools, especially if you download clip art or vector drawings that you open up in Illustrator and using these two tools, you can do a whole lot of stuff. So we're gonna do a whole lot of stuff with the things that we downloaded from the announcement section once we get through the toolbar. So, okay, so I'm gonna get rid of these now. I'm gonna select them with the global selection arrow and I'm gonna hit delete. Because this scary little thing that looks like a quill pen, which is called the pen tool, is what freaks everyone out. When I was in school, the teacher would download coloring books and with the pen tool, I had to outline every character in every page of the coloring book and they would give us like a 15 page coloring book. And that's how they taught us to use the pen tool, drawing over and over and over again using the pen tool. I'm gonna show you how to do it with a photograph. The pen tool is a really complex process mentally, but a really simple tool. So we spent time with the lasso tool in Photoshop where we were trying to select pixels and delete them and copy them and do stuff to our selection. And I was like, oh man, you can freeform hand with the lasso tool or you can use the polygon or magnetic lasso. The pen tool is where you do a lot of things from a drawing standpoint in Illustrator. So I'm gonna take the pen tool, which is right here. So here it is. And you're gonna notice there is a fill and a stroke, just like a regular shape. I'm gonna turn off the fill, so there's no fill, and I'm gonna turn on the stroke. And for the stroke, I'm just gonna make the stroke black. So I can either double click on the stroke and drag my cursor all the way down to the bottom corner, which you'll notice RGB is zero, zero, zero. And if you had web design class with me, you know the hex number for black is zero, 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 zero. <laughs> but you can drag it to the corner or, you can click on the swatches library and just pick the black swatch. So whatever works best for you, you can do it either way. Now, 
really important before we start doing anything. The pen tool is made up of nodes. Well, we just saw nodes. Nodes are what a circle is made up and there's four of them or a rectangle is made up and there's four of them, right? A node is anywhere a line changes direction. So every time I click the pen tool, I'm gonna to put down a node, a little blue square. We're gonna start with just straight lines so that you can see how the pen tool works. So I'm gonna take my pen tool and I'm gonna click once on the artboard and let go. And when I click once and let go, you're gonna see this little anchor, this little blue node. Now watch, I'm gonna move my mouse away and look what's happening. A smart guide is telling me, oh, you wanna draw a line. So if I move my mouse over here and click, there is a black line that's been started. The reason there's a black line is because there's no fill and there's a stroke of black, right? And watch as I click my mouse and let go. Click, 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 click. Every time I click and let go, I add another node to my shape that I'm drawing, right? Oh man, Chip, you're really good at this. All right, click, let go, click, let go. Now, a circle is a closed shape of four nodes. If I'm using the pen tool and I want to close this shape, watch what happens when my pen tool goes back to the first node. A little circle appears next to the pen tool, a little circle that's black on the outside, white on the inside. What that circle means is you want to close this shape just like a rectangle, just like a circle, just like the star tool and the shape tool. If I take the pen tool and I draw anything and I go back to the original node and I click it, that is now a complete shape. So when you see illustrations on uh, cereal boxes and it's a tiger and the tiger has an orange paw, and the orange paw has little white nails on the end of it. The orange paw is one pen tool shape and each nail is a pen tool shape. Each nail is an individual triangular shape placed on top of the pen tool full shape of the hand. Very rarely do you see shapes in illustration that aren't closed shapes and thus they're like an eyelash or there's a wrinkle on the hand or there's a little line under the eyeball or there's an eyebrow. Those things are not full shapes. They're just stroke lines. Everything else you see is like a coloring book where each shape is colored in like a coloring book would be. So if I use the pen tool and I go around and make a shape, if I go back to where I started, the shape is a full shape. So if I put color in the shape, you're gonna see that this thing is colored in now. It's colored in because it's a full shape. Now remember from when I deleted a dot or a node in the rectangle or the square, it became a different shape. Now watch as I delete each node in my pen tool. You see why the white started to appear there? It started to appear there and look here, it's no longer a completed shape. So you're starting to see fill color encroaching on the shape because it's trying to figure out, don't you really wanna close the shape? Isn't that what you were thinking when you drew the shape? Now you'll notice when the lines inside are overlap, it doesn't look any different because it's still filled in. But watch as I start working my way back around. The object's trying to figure out, well, where is the fill and where is the stroke? I know you meant to make a full shape. So let's try to make this a full shape, even though you didn't touch the node that you started with to make it a full shape. So if you ever see weird stuff like this happening on a vector graphic, where there's no stroke in part of the object is because the shape wasn't closed. Now, here's where the pen tool gets tricky. So let's click our mouse one time and let go. And we're gonna put a node down. 
Now, instead of just clicking and releasing, watch what happens if I move my mouse over and I click and hold the mouse down and drag. Oh my Lord, we're making directional anchors, forward anchor, backward anchor, right? And look is how I pivot. As I pivot, it's convex, concave, convex, concave, convex, concave. It's curving based on the direction I pull the directional anchor. The further I go out, the deeper the curve. The closer I get, the flatter the curve. The more I dip down, the bigger the arch. The more I dip up, the convex the arch. This is the hardest thing to do in digital illustration. It's creating a curved line. So I'm gonna click and let go and hit delete a couple of times because look at the way you can create an arch. If I just click a million times, I can make the line seem like it's curving. But look at how many nodes there are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 nodes to make that thing that looks like it's kind of curving. Watch what happens if I click my mouse and let go and I go over here and click and pull to make an arch and let go. Look at how many nodes made that curve versus the number of nodes that made this curve. 14 of them to do that and two to do this. The really good digital drawlers can make shapes in very few nodes. Every introduction to Illustrator and students try to draw with it, they make curves like this, right? Because they're nervous. They're trying to figure out how to make that line curve. So they click the mouse a lot of times. Is this wrong? No. Is this better? Maybe yes. Because remember, if I want to direct select and make modifications, I can change this with one click. Look if I had to do it here. Right, I got to select each one of these in order to make this thing curve differently. I used to give students a project where I would give them the outline of a frog and I would be like, I'm going to give you an A on your next project, whatever student could do it in the least number of notes. And I would have the silhouette of a frog and some students would do it in 150 nodes, right? In order them to trace a little silhouette of their frog. And some students would do it in like five, six or seven nodes, right? It's the practice process of knowing how far I can go and click and drag my mouse and get the curve, the beat the way I want it before the curve has to change directions. So all shapes have curves and all curves change directions. So it's how your brain sees a picture of an object and recognize where the object changes direction. That's how the pen tool works, just like how it works in real life, right? Your fingers are straight and then they curve at the tip and then they're straight again. So when you see things like the glo white glove on Mickey Mouse's hand, he's got a straight line, a curve at the end and a straight line. That's how his glove fingers are made. There's only four nodes to make each finger, not 14 nodes to make each finger. The pen tool is the hardest thing by far. And your book actually gives you lines that it wants you to trace in order to kind of practice the pen tool. It's the same as downloading a picture from the internet and putting it on the artboard and practicing the pen tool. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna take a photo off the internet and we're gonna to try to practice playing around with the pen tool a little bit, just so that you can see how it works because it's the most important tool in all of the toolbar. Keeping in mind that if you use an iPad with an Apple pencil, you can just click and draw with the pencil. <laughs> you don't need the mouse. So digital art has come a long way for illustrators because it's literally pencil to paper, but it's digital with the pen tool because the pencil stylus on a screen will actually do the same thing as pencil lead on a piece of paper. So digital art 
has come a long way. If I use a photograph and I use my Apple Pencil and Adobe Draw or Adobe Illustrator, they call it now, I can literally trace the photograph with the pen tool and make it look exactly like the thing on the photo because I'm literally tracing the photo versus having to draw it with the mouse in Illustrator. I think anyone can follow the lines of a shape with a pencil on a piece of glass versus click, 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 click with the mouse. So just know that technology has made the concept of drawing a lot easier. If I go out and photograph something and then I use my iPad and I draw over top of the photograph with my Apple pencil, anyone I think can use a pencil on glass and literally trace the shape with the pencil on the glass and make a really accurate vector drawing. The trick is taking a decent photo that you're gonna trace with the pencil in your iPad or your Samsung Galaxy or whatever in order to do it really well. Digital arts come a long way, digital illustrations come a long way. So let's go out onto the internet. So we're just gonna go out on the internet and we're gonna search on Google for a bird. So let's do, uh, uh, let's do uh, blue jay bird. They're pretty, I always like them. You could do a cardinal too if you want. Those are the two popular birds, cardinals and blue jays. Now, remember, we don't need an illustration. We can use a photograph of a bird because we're just gonna draw over the top of it so you can see how Illustrator works. So I'm gonna go to the images tab. Same thing we did when we searched for photos for Photoshop lecture. And so I did Blue Jay. You could do whatever bird you want to. There's some really beautiful birds out there. Maybe you're a bird person and you know of a whippoorwill or something like that and you want to draw that. Uh, I took my kids a couple of years ago up to, uh, uh, to a place in Georgia and they had a bird, bird place. And so we went and listened to the lecture from the bird person and they were talking about um, scavenger birds and how they're the cleanest birds in the world and they're super smart. And if they're in captivity, they figure out how to get out really quickly. And I'm like, you're talking about the scavenger birds on the side of the road, they're eating things when they get hit by a car. And they're like, yeah, they're the cleanest, smartest birds you'll ever see in your life. And I'm like, no way. And they're like, oh yeah, there was one in captivity and they used to have the treats on their belt when they would go in to feed the birds. And the bird quickly realized that there were times when the person that fed would bend down in order to fill water things. And the bird grabbed the bag off of the belt and ate all the treats while the person was doing it because they quickly realized the person was habitual and did the exact same thing over and over again. And they figured out how to get their own treats. And they're like, these birds are really smart. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not gonna think the same way when I see a bunch of them on the side of the road eating a squirrel. Like, <laughs> got it. I'm gonna think this is a really smart pack of birds. <laughs> so, all right, so we, have, so we have Blue Jays, Cardinals, whatever bird you think is great. We're gonna take a picture of that bird because I just wanna trace the silhouette of it so you can kind of see how this thing works. I like if I'm gonna be doing digital illustration, I took a really nice photo and I'm gonna draw all over the top of it or something like that. I try to pick pictures where the separation between background and object is one where there's a distinct separation, which means remember green screen, objects on white backgrounds. When you're doing digital illustration or digital art and you're using a photograph as a reference to create a basic drawing, you want to try to find something that has a good separation between background and object so you can tell where the edge is. Because remember, the edge is the stroke and the thing in the inside is the fill. So you can really quickly see on this bird the black pattern on the face, the gray beak, the blue of the head, the black crown here. Those are all fills and stroke shapes and the silhouette of the bird. So I just want to make sure that whatever picture I grab I can see a distinct shape on the edges. Look at this one flying, it's spectacular where you see all of the shapes. If you squint your eyes and you can see all the separate shapes in that photograph, think of those as fills and strokes in Illustrator. So I'm just gonna find one that I think is pretty that has the basic details I need. This one on the black background is really nice, but I think I'm just gonna take this one. So if you did cardinals, blue jays, whatever, I'm from Baltimore, so oriole bird, that would be really nice if you like to do that. Um, so I have this little picture right here. So I can right click on it and do save image as, 
and I'm just going to dump the picture on the desktop so it sticks it over there so I can draw it. Um, in some programs, if you have like a Mac, you can drag and drop it over there. In PC world, sometimes they give you a weird web link if you try to drag an image from the internet to the desktop. So if you need to right click on it to save the image, whatever you got to do to get it over there, you need it over somewhere where you can find it so that you can then put it into Illustrator so we can practice our pen tool a little bit. Now, if you learn nothing from Illustrator class, right? Cutting objects and putting them together in, in Photoshop is a really important skill. And I was like, if you can cut objects out of one photo and put it into another photo, you've basically got the basics of Photoshop out of graphic design one. Cutting a picture and putting it into another picture, which was one of your chapter assignments. Take the shells, take the screws, take the frame, put it all into a picture, scale down the screws, put them in the corners. If you can place a photo in Illustrator and do some basic shapes over the top of it, just basic shapes to make the object, you have hit a home run in Illustrator. Because in essence, that's what Illustrator is. It's shapes of fills and strokes that make up objects that are scalable that you can recognize, which are called illustrations, digital illustrations. And they come in murals and train graphics and big, huge bus graphics and logos that are on T-shirts and bags and packaging design and on billboards and on uh, big, huge graphics on buildings. I mean, Illustrator is only a series of fills and strokes, objects that are fills and strokes made up into complex things called digital illustrations. But they're really simple in nature, fills and strokes. That's it. All right, so now that we have this little picture over here on the desktop, we're going to use it as a reference for the pen tool. If you can use the selection arrow, the direct select arrow, the pen tool, the shape tool, and the text tool, you can do pretty much everything you could ever dream of in Illustrator. All these fancy things down the bottom is for special scaling. It's for erasing parts of it. It's for the width tool to change the thickness to eye drop. All these things on the bottom really mean nothing below the text tool. These are all enhanced features that you can do with your shapes as you get a little more complicated in Illustrator. If you know the selection arrow, the direct select arrow, the pen tool, the shape tool, the text tool, you can do pretty much you would, anything you would ever want to do as a digital illustration goes. All this other stuff is just enhanced work. Illustrators can live off those first five or six tools. Okay, so we need to get that picture from saved on our computer into Illustrator over here, right? We need to get it here so that we can draw on it. So we either can do file place which is the easiest way. So let's go to file place and let's grab that little picture that we saved out onto hopefully the desktop or somewhere on your computer where you can recognize it. File, save, where you put it. So we're gonna do file place. And you're gonna notice when you do file place, you get this little icon saying, hey, do you wanna place this picture that looks really great here on Illustrator? And I'm gonna say yes. So I'm just gonna tap my mouse. Oh my goodness. Zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, zoom out. Look how big this picture is, which means really good quality, right? If it comes in really big, it means really good quality because the way Illustrator works is it brings it in as 100% final output, which means this is a really big picture. I'm gonna delete it real quick and I'm gonna do file place again. Because watch what happens if I do file place, but instead of tapping my mouse, I click and drag my mouse. I can actually draw what's called a container and drop the picture in only as big as the box I drag. If I take it from the desktop and drag it and drop it in Illustrator, look how big it is. That's final output. That's how big the picture is in its quality. If I file place it and tap my mouse, it comes in at 100% final output or resolution quality, really big. If I file place, but I file place and I drag it to the size of the document I'm working in, I force it to be placed in proportion to the size of the thing I'm working. Hmm? You can, yes. So if I just file place this thing and I tap my mouse one time, right? File place and I tap my mouse. Remember, I have a bounding box. 
But also remember, if I don't hold down shift, my bird just got ran over, right? It squishes the picture. It distorts the picture. So if you're scaling anything in any program, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign, I'm trying to think of any programs where you can put pictures in it. If you're scaling a picture, please hold down shift. You can always tell someone that created a piece of design and they put it out there for the world to see and the photos and the design look squished or low resolution or just terrible is because they had no idea what they were doing. And they squished the picture or they scaled it up too big or whatever. All right, so we got our little guy in here and I'm gonna grab the corner and hold down shift so he's a little bit smaller so you can see that he's inside my document. This is called a raster based image. If you give me your out of book project and I see a bunch of these things, that means that all you did was collage photos in an illustrator file and give it to me. That does not show me that you know how to use graphics that are scalable. It's okay if you go to Vectezi and you grab a bunch of pre-drawn illustrations and you copy them from all different files and you paste them all into one file and you make your own little illustration from it, I'm okay with that. You don't have to be able to create. Your out of book for Illustrator is, hey, we've created a couple of new apps. Can you make a little illustration icon for the apps? And one of them is called like peek a book. You need an open book. It's okay if you go and get an illustration of a book that's open and you copy it and put it into Illustrator and you just type the word peek a book underneath of it. I'm okay with that. Uh, you're showing how to use vector graphics in a way that would be a final output, right? Final output. So it's okay to grab stuff from other place. It's also okay if you find a photo of an open book and you wanna use your pen tool and try to draw the book over top of the photo. It's practice. It's okay to do it both ways. Maybe one time you want to try it by tracing a book and another time you want to do it by finding an illustration of a book and maybe just changing the color of it. Either way is okay. The idea is that you're creating something that has a professional output purpose. Illustrator is for scalable graphics. Your final submissions need to be scalable graphics. I don't care if they're downloaded and copied and pasted and put together and create your own collage from them, or you trace and draw all over pictures and have fun creating your own. The bottom line is you can't give me a bunch of photos placed in Illustrator to make it look like an open book, but it's got a box around it and it's a photo. That's not a scalable graphics. That's not an output that we can use as a professional application. Even though we're only doing graphic design one, the very basics of graphic design, I still want you to understand why you would use the program and what the final product would look like so that it's professional when you're done to finishing it. So if someone came to you and said, I own a landscape business and I would really love to have a beautiful flower. I don't know flowers very well, so I'm gonna throw out orchid, right? I want a really beautiful orchid. I don't know why I'd want an orchid on the side of a landscaping business because I don't think they trim those, but right? If you wanted an orchid on the side of your truck, the landscaping business, don't give them a photograph of an orchid. They can't do anything with that. But if you take a photograph of an orchid and you use the pen tool and you make a little illustration over top of the photo and you give them that illustration, that is a scalable graphic. They can put that on their business card. They could screen print t-shirts. They could make it really big and put it on the side of the trailer that they're towing that has all their landscaping equipment in it. You can't give them a photograph. I spend my entire creative business life redrawing things for people that gave them a photograph and they can't do anything with it.
All right, so here we are. All right, so now we have our little picture placed and I'm just gonna use the command plus key to zoom in a little bit, right? So I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see Mr. Birdie here. So here he is, right? So we can tackle this bird one of two ways, right? Because a pen tool is putting nodes to create a line that starts the shape. So when I draw over photographs, I do one thing immediately. I pick the pen tool and then I remove the fill because you don't want to fill because watch what happens yeah. as I'm trying to draw over the bird, right? I can't see the bird because I have a fill over the thing I'm trying to trace. So when I pick the pen tool, I immediately remove the fill and add a stroke. And obviously the easiest stroke to see is black. So if I'm using my pen tool to practice drawing, I use no fill and a stroke. Can I go back later and add a fill? Absolutely. So coloring books are all strokes and no fills. You're using the coloring pencil or the crayon to add the fill. No different when you're trying to create the line is that you're trying to have it with a stroke but no fill. So you see my little birdie right here. So I'm gonna show you the first way that every student draws with the pen tool. Yes. A one or whatever the default is, is typically one. So most students do this, right? They're trying to learn the pen tool and they just click it a bunch of times to get around the shape of the bird, right? And there's nothing wrong with this, right? There's nothing wrong with this. And if I zoom in a little bit closer, I can really see the edge of this bird. And I could just go on around the bird. And as I get a little more comfortable with how far I've got to go, I just maybe go a little bit further before I click my mouse, right? And I'm just holding down the space bar in order to move my artboard. And look at this. I mean, I can go right around this bird and trace the silhouette of this bird. And I'm gonna do this really quickly just so that you can see, oh my gosh, I would have never been able to make the silhouette of a blue jay without a photograph and the pen tool. Wow, the bird's nails are pretty wicked on this particular photograph, I gotta be honest. I never knew blue jays had that sharp of nails. So I haven't clicked and dragged at all. These are all straight lines. I literally have not dragged my pen tool with the button held down. I am just using straight lines. And so, and I'm gonna hold down the space bar just to move my way around. And gosh, I've only been doing this for probably 45 seconds. And I went all the way back to where I started, right? So there we are, we have a closed shape. I'm gonna to switch to my global selection arrow and look at this, if I zoom out, this thing has a bounding box. There it is right there. Here is my bird. Watch what happens if I make it a fill and not a stroke. So I'm gonna hit this little toggle switch. That's not a bad blue jay. If I needed a bird for a logo, that's not a bad bird. I'm gonna make him blue because he's a blue jay. Maybe it'll add to the pride of my bird, right? But you see a lot of illustrations like this where it's actually straight lines and an artist went through and they just detailed dot, 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 a million nodes. So if I zoom in, I got a lot of nodes. I don't wanna count them all, but there's gotta be at least 75 there, I bet, to make this little blue jay guy. Not bad though. And if I use my text tool and I just write bird next to it, I'm gonna make the word bigger. This is just like Photoshop. I just tap my text tool down to write the word. And then I'm just using my character palette to make it bigger, right? No different than Photoshop. And look at that, not bad, right? If I needed to make something that had some text like a logo, bird, logo.
maybe I want to hold down shift, make the bird a little smaller and stick them on the L, right? Not a bad attempt using click, 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 click around 75 or so times. But let's see if we can do a little bit better than 75 nodes for the bird. Here is where practice and students end up doing this and they end up spending hours and hours and hours, right? Because it eats up a lot of time to practice the pen tool, but it gets a bit addicting as well. And they're like, oh, let me see if I can trace this. Let me try to trace this. Let me try to trace this. Oh, my kids really like SpongeBob. I'm gonna see if I can get a photo and trace SpongeBob. And then I'm gonna make it have no fill and only a stroke. And I'm gonna print it on my home printer and they can make their own coloring book, right? The pen tool can get very addicting. Now. Watch what happens if I zoom in a little bit and I use the pen tool. So I'm gonna to zoom in one more time. Now watch how far I can go in just a couple of clicks. You'll notice the crown is very straight. So let me switch it, right? No fill, only a stroke. And just for the sake of the process, I'm gonna make the stroke thicker just so you can definitely see the line when I'm drawing it. So I'm gonna click my mouse once and I'm gonna click here. So there's my line, right? Well, watch if I go all the way over here and click and drag. Oh, now, if last little nugget in the pen tool world, you see that directional anchor? Now I haven't clicked my mouse again, but look how it's already curving, right? Well, that's a problem with the beak because if I tap right there, this guy's got the beak of like the birds that dig for things in the sand not the beak of a blue jay. I don't even know what those are, egrets or, I don't know what they call those birds with a really long hooked beak and they go in and they go in the sand and I don't know how they do it, but they always catch fish and stuff. It's like the most amazing thing I've ever seen, right? But if you click and drag a really long line, then the directional anchor is gonna be really long. Well, watch what happens if I move my mouse to the middle dot. If I move my mouse to the middle dot, I get an inverted V. Right? So if I click and drag my mouse, I get directional anchors. And you can see it. You see how it's curving to go to the next line. If I move back to the middle dot, which is the actual anchor or node, you get an inverted V. Watch if I tap my mouse on the middle dot. It got rid of the forward directional anchor. Why is that important? Well, watch this curve back to the middle dot and click curve back to the middle dot and click curve back to the middle dot and click i can curve and then do straight curve and then do straight i don't have to be as comfortable with the directional anchor because it's only curving the line i'm making not the next line I'm drawing. So watch, if I click and drag and I go back, so see how it's curving already? In this case, it's not the problem because I'm doing the chest of the bird. So watch, if I click and drag, I can continue that curve. Here's the problem, look at the curve now. Unless his chest is going in like that, I got a problem, right? The line is curving. But if I go back to that dot and click, watch what happens. I can curve again. And watch if I go back to the middle dot and click. I can curve again. Go back to the middle dot and click. And I can curve again. The easiest way to draw with the pen tool is click and curve and then remove the forward directional anchor. That way you're only responsible for knowing the line that you're curving. You don't have to worry about the fact that, well, I can't click it that far to curve it because the next line doesn't curve that way. You don't have to worry about that at all because you remove the forward anchor and you were only worried about the line you were drawing. So watch, now I'm, now I'm golden. So now if I do that, curve, go back to the middle, curve, go back to the middle, curve, go back to the middle, straight line, straight line, straight line, curve, go back to the middle, straight line, 
curve, go back to the middle, straight line. Go back to the middle. 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 Straight, straight. Curve, go back to the middle. Curve, go back to the middle. Straight line, straight line. Curve, go back to the middle. Straight line, straight line, straight line, straight line. Curve, go back to the middle. Straight line, straight line, straight line. Curve, go back to the middle, straight line. Curve, actually this one curves nicely because it's the arch of his back. And so now let's compare those two silhouettes. Well, you can already see the head of this bird to the head of that bird way smoother than this bird. The chest way smoother than this jagged chest. The tail way smoother. The curve of this way better. The leg much smoother. By clicking and dragging and then removing the forward directional anchor, you can trace a lot easier. So look at that. Two ways of doing it. Neither is wrong. Maybe jagged is the illustration style you were going for, not so smooth. Traditionally, all the icons, all the logos, all of the illustrations you see that are what we call graphics or graphic in nature have curves and straight lines. They're a little bit smoother like this. But photos are limitless. The ability to have something to trace is limitless. Right, so if I wanted to just trace the bird's shapes inside of it now, this is where graphic, graphic comes into play. You can see this shape, right? It's black. This shape is part of the bird's head. So if I went in here with my pen tool, I can actually see each shape that makes up this bird. That blue is a shape. The white of his brow is a shape. The top of his beak is the shape. His nostril is a shape. Every, his eyeball is a shape. The little uh, kind of like the tussles of hair here under his beak is a shape. When you see things in black and white, like if this picture was black and white, you would see that was black. His eyeball and crest was black. His head would be white, right? All illustration is digital illustrator illustration is, is seeing each one of these shapes and making them an illustrator. So if I was doing just the top of his beak, I would make this a shape. And so I'm just gonna curve it. Cause his nostril goes right there. And that's the top part of his beak. So if I was doing a logo, and I needed to create the bird, and I was gonna do the bird in a couple of colors, I would make the bird blue, and I would make his beak black, All right? So each shape in the MC, the crest to his neck, that would be black, but the bird would be blue. So I would just make the crest of his neck its own shape. Now, the way I draw is I draw the whole shape first and then each of the little individual shapes that make up the bird on top of the outline of the bird. So the silhouette is what I draw first and then I draw all the little details that make up the silhouette second. So if I need to do the eyeball, I would just use my pen tool. I would click in one corner. I would click here and curve. I would go back to the middle anchor. I would go back here and curve, and there's my eyeball. 
So here's the perfect eyeball for my illustration. And so I'm just gonna take it and I'm gonna move it up here. And there's my eyeball. And so you can see I'm starting to create all of the shapes that make up this little birdie and I'm using a photograph to do it. And each one of those little shapes is a fill and a stroke. Now, let's leap that forward so you can see what little shapes of fills and strokes can become if you know the pen tool and you can visualize things as individual shapes. So let's go to our lecture files for this week. And we're gonna start with this file right here. So I'm gonna to go to in Illustrator to File, Open, and I'm gonna open up my Beach Icon EPS file. So I'm gonna to go to Beach Icon EPS file. And it's gonna ask me if I wanna slice this thing. And what slicing means is that it's creating it into parts to use for web. I don't wanna, I don't wanna slice it, so I'm gonna say no. And now look at this. These are vector objects. So look at all of them. When I click on them, look at all the individual shapes that make up these things. So how do I select individual shapes? Well, remember direct select. So look at, I'm gonna zoom in. Look at all the shapes that make up these sunglasses. There's the frames, there's the lenses, there's the ear piece, there's the other ear piece, here's the highlight on the lens, here's the other highlight on the lens. Do I need to know how to draw glasses per se? Well, if I take this piece, and I copy it and I go over to my bird and I paste it, my bird can have glasses. Did I have to draw those glasses? Nope. Hanging out now. Yeah, Mr. Bird chilling with a pair of glasses, right? I don't have to know how to draw these objects. There's tons of them out there. Look at this little line. Man, I really wanna help out and do a little, I don't know, margarita party or something logo for a company. Look at this lime here. Now, when you open up clip art, which is what this is, you'll notice that it's all grouped. It's all grouped. So if I use my global selection arrow, all of these objects are together. Well, I don't need all of the objects. I just need this little fruit piece here or this little glass here. If I right click on it, you're gonna see ungroup. Watch if I ungroup, I have my global selection arrow. Now I only have that. See each thing is its own thing. All right, fine, let me right click on it, ungroup it again. Look what I have, just this that I can copy. Zoom, 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 zoom. Maybe I wanna change the color of the drink. I'm gonna click there. I'm gonna go in and make it a little more yellow. I'm gonna click on this circle, make this one a little bit more limey. Make this one, which is tinted in blue, a little darker. All of these shapes are just like I drew with the bird. The only difference is they're already drawn for you. They're literally all there. So if I right click on it and I ungroup it, I can take just the fruit, copy it, go into my bird, paste it. Here's my bird guy. There it is, go back to my vector graphic. Maybe I want to include a palm tree, but I don't want both palm trees. Right click, ungroup, 
one palm tree. Copy it, go back to my bird, paste it. I'm gonna take my bird with his glasses now. I'm holding down shift. And I'm gonna right click and bring him to front. And he's hanging out on the palm tree. Uh, I think he needs a sun. So I'm gonna copy it. I'm gonna go over here to my drawing. I'm gonna paste the sun. I'm gonna hold down shift and scale it down. I'm gonna put it here, but I'm gonna right click on it. And I'm gonna send it to back. Oh man. Did I know how to draw the palm tree? Absolutely not. We could have done this. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, but you gotta learn the tools in order to be able to create the appropriate finished thing. Now, let's take it one step further. Let's file open the really beautiful beach scene. So this is someone that really knows what they're doing with Illustrator, right? Because look at all of these parts. If I right click on it, cloud, sky, palm trees, I mean, just really beautiful shapes that are all layered to create this really kind of beautiful illustration. But I can go in and copy my son. I'm gonna bring some of my pieces in now into my beach vacation. I actually like this sun better. I'm gonna put that in there. I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna bring that to front. So now it's in front of my son. I do need to make my son a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna scale it down a little bit. There it is. Uh, I'm gonna go over here. I really think there needs to be maybe a hat sitting on the beach. So I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna paste it over here. Oh gonna hold down shift and make it a little smaller and stick it on the beach here. But I got a problem because the hat is the wrong color because it's blending right in with the beach. So let me use my direct select. I'm gonna pick the brim and double click on it. And I don't know, purple seems nice. I'm gonna go with purple, maybe this band. I need to make it a darker purple. And I'm gonna make the shadow of the brim a lighter purple, and I'm gonna pick the orange, make this a lighter purple, and the brim needs to be a darker purple. Right, I don't have to know how to draw the hat. I just envisioned a hat on the beach, maybe a beach ball, so let's take the beach ball, copy that, bring it on over here. Big old beach ball floating in the water, maybe. Drop him over there. Yeah, I, I could juxtapose a few things. Keep in mind that this is a pretty complicated drawing. So, in order to do that, these are all of the objects inside of this drawing. I would have to send some things to back mm -hmm. in order to do that in order to sneak it in somewhere. I'd probably do the lazy technique and just move it over here and move these things to front, right? So if I did that, uh, I could put the beach ball back there or something, right? But yes, each one of these objects is a shape that is stacked in a different order of this particular illustration. So if I found the spot and did send it back, send it back, or send backwards, send backwards, send backwards, I could find it where the wave and the ball was a spot. So maybe if I put it here and I do send backwards, well, maybe it's getting there. So let's see, send backwards. 
Yeah, so you see this and this and this. I'd have to find that grouping of those waves. So there they are right there, the three groupings. So where's my ball? So if I take my ball and drag it up here, oh my gosh. I could find the right spot maybe. It's somewhere here. So here it is. So I'm wondering if, so which spot is that? It's that one. And this one is this one. They've got an interesting thing going on here. I think they made a layer. Oh, you see this? This is one big layer. So this stripe isn't a layer by itself. So I can't cut the end of the ball off easily because this shape is that entire shape. So if I squish it down, So if I squish it down, then maybe I could put that there. It's tricky. So now it's, it's cut, close. see it's cut off because, so now you can really see the shape. So it is kind of now lost in the waves but there's lots of shapes involved in this illustration, but um, yes. So vector world, but places like Vecteezy, they got a million different subject matters and you can copy and paste shapes, sandals. Now these sandals aren't the right perspective for it. You could drop them in there. Now, I'd have to do some perspective on the objects in order to distort them a little bit so they were a little bit flatter. But for the sake of learning vector graphics and just understanding the composition of them, uh, this is these top tools are all you need. Direct select, regular select, pen tool, shape tool, and in essence, text tool in order to create vector graphics here. Now your book does very simple tracing, moving objects together to make a complete object. But now you can see it from a professional standpoint, what it takes to create fills and strokes in shapes and make those shapes scalable. Because now look what happens with this image. Like if I select all these things and I hold down shift, It's still perfect. I mean, it's absolutely perfect. This thing is itty bitty now. It's still perfect. If I zoom out to the document, look how small it is on a letter sized piece of paper. I mean, it's tiny, tiny. It's smaller than a stamp. But look how good it is when you zoom in. I mean, even when you zoom in, I mean, it's still perfect. That's 6,400%, 64,000%. 64, Look at it at 100%. I mean, that's the beauty of Illustrator. You can't do that in Photoshop. This thing would work on the sides of a bus all the way down to smaller than a stamp. I mean, just beautifully perfect. Look how small I can make this. Still perfect at 100%. Oh my gosh, look at that, it's a pinhead. It's a pinhead at 100%. It's kind of like the people that look in those little things and they see the things in them. You ever see the artists that like paint on thimbles? and you actually look on like the pinheads and stuff and they have art, that in essence is this. I mean, look at the detail hidden at 25,000%. I mean, it's crazy.
All right, I'm going to end this recording because we're at about two hours. And I always like to keep the recording to about two hours um, so that everyone can watch it back. So um, I'm going to give you an opportunity now to play around a little bit in Illustrator, use the pen tool, play around a little bit, draw and make some shapes.